my thanks uh, for the beautiful and soothing music this morning. As uh, President Holland mentioned, our uh, neighborhood association in Bountiful, I, uh, a thought went went through my mind. You know how great he is. I'm not know. I'm not sure you know how great Pat is. Uh, except of the respect you have for her, I'm sure. Uh, picture with, just to give you an idea. Picture with me for the moment. Uh, Canyon Crest Drive, which is <clears throat> where the Hollands live and we live in Bountiful. It's up against the mountains. It crosses uh, one of the canyons that uh, is now famous as Barton Creek. And uh, you go down and then up. Now, uh, also picture about 5.30 or 6 in the morning. And I'm uh, jogging, and I see two uh, forms in front of me. As I get closer, I see that uh, it's a man and a woman. And um, as I get closer, I see that the woman is pushing the man up the hill. <laughs> as I get closer, I hear <clears throat> him say, but, Pat, I'd rather go back and sleep. I don't want to be healthy. And she'd say, come on, Jeff, I know you can do it. And so she would push him up the hill. It almost was that way, really. They're great friends, and uh, it's good to be here with them and with you. I have, uh, I have a great respect for the Brigham Young University. I, I didn't attend here. And the day that I wanted to be an engineer, BYU didn't have an engineering school. At least it didn't have one that was uh, with the reputation that it has now. And so I didn't attend. Uh, we've had four daughters who have attended here, and I assume a fifth one will if uh, when she finishes up at Rick's. My wife attended here. I have great respect for you. I uh, <clears throat> have been enough in enough places in the church uh, throughout the world in the last uh, eleven and a half years to know that from the ranks of this institution have come and will come some of the great leaders of the church, of uh, communities, of government, business, and I suppose more importantly, the uh, solid families of the church, uh, many of them will start here. I think your uh, opportunities are unlimited. I think the opportunities that you have are bounded only by what you may impose, either by your willingness or unwillingness to pay the price of success. How we live in a day like no other. Those of you who review the scriptures know that the signs of the times are around us and the prophecies of men of old uh, have unfolded or are unfolding in the process. These are the days that uh, are preceding the second coming of the Master. I've made some observations on my own as a member of the bishopric and some things that we have responsibility for in that bishopric. For instance, a sign of the times, if you will, uh, in the decade of the 70s, 1970 to 1980, somewhere in the world, the church built about 2,000 chapels. That's in 10-year period. The year 1981 and 82, following that decade, we built somewhere in the world almost 2,000 chapels in two years. And we have more than 1,000 in some process right now. Um, you've read of the temples that <clears throat> have been dedicated for this year, one this week. Uh, the Tahitian temple later on in the week. 1st of December, another one in Mexico City, 
And I suppose next year there will be uh, five or six temples dedicated somewhere in the world. And as you know, the great work of the millennium is the work that will go on in temples. It seems to me there's a preparation going on. Now, there are many wonderful things happening. But there's also something that I'd like to address this morning that uh, I hope will have your attention. This is also a time of danger. This is a time to be careful, as you've never been careful before. It's a time to be on guard, because this is the time, as I read the scripture, referred to when the hearts of men will fail them. This is a time when even the very elect will be deceived. This is a time when some will not have the courage to stand <clears throat> for what's right. This is a time when there will be a complacency. There is a complacency. There's a taking for granted of gospel principles. This is a time when many, I suppose some among your number, who will pick and choose the commandments they will keep and others that they will put aside for the moment. This is the time when Satan is unusually cunning and effective, and I think he entraps many, many of us here today, without our knowing it. It's a time of trial. I've come to appreciate that trials come to children and teenagers and university students and parents, prophets, apostles. I weep as I watch the trials of President Kimball. Trials are a part of everyone's life. Now, with all of this, there is a hope because I'm convinced that there is a spirit of revelation available to all of us, available to guide us uh, in our trials. As you uh, <clears throat> face your trials and what life may bring you, may I suggest one thing to remember. When you're in tune with the Spirit, you can handle any problem. Now, I don't want to make you think that those that are in tune with the Spirit don't have problems. Everyone has them. But when you're in tune with the Spirit, you're able to cope with the situation. And when you aren't, and to the degree you aren't, <clears throat> then things can become unglued and come apart at the seams and we uh, lose our composure. I know it's a fact of life that all of us here this morning vary in the degree of our testimony. Not everyone here has the same strength of faith and testimony that the other one does. There are those of you who are unusually strong, spiritually speaking. Others of us may be up and down the ladder. Sometimes we become discouraged if our strength and faith is not what another one's faith is. Sometimes we feel uh, less important, less capable. May I suggest to you, <clears throat> I do not think it matters where you are on the ladder of faith and testimony. What I think matters is which way you are moving on the ladder. And there are many great and wonderful people who, whose testimonies are just beginning to flower, and as you would say, they are on the bottom rungs of the ladder, but they're moving that way. And that's the thing that's important. There are others. Some of you return missionaries want to keep, might want to keep this in mind. There are others maybe who have peaked out and have begun to taper and slip somewhat in their faith, and that's when I would get nervous, and that's when I would get uh, concerned. Which way are you moving is what is important. This is the process of purification, of sanctification, this process of improving, increasing in faith and testimony. Now, as some of us may be waiting for blessings to come to us, let's remember another principle. Moroni taught in the Book of Ether something that oftentimes we forget. There are those that are constantly waiting for things to happen. They are waiting for blessings to come, not understanding what that great prophet taught. 
Moroni taught in the twelfth chapter that first we have an evidence of our faith and a trial of our faith, and then the blessing comes. We don't receive blessings to strengthen our faith, according to Moroni. We receive blessings because of our faith. Eternal life is the blessing of the faithful. faithful. Now a thought this morning that has uh, to do with this sanctification and purification process. Developing purity of thought is as vital and as important a part of the sanctification process that I know anything about. President George Q. Cannon, a former pre- counsel from the presidency of the Church, first presidency, said the following, If a man be pure in thought, he will be correspondingly pure in action. <clears throat> but if he allows his mind to roam in unrestricted freedom through the various avenues of evil, or to dwell unchecked upon the contemplation of forbidden indulgences, it will not be long before his feet tread those paths and his hand plucks the tempting but deceitful fruit. Once the tempter gains the citadel of your heart, his power is very great, and there is no knowing to what excesses of folly and crime he may incite his unhappy victim. End of the quote. The destructive forces of Satan <clears throat> are becoming increasingly more effective in their relentless pursuit of the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere. Many, quite innocently, and let me emphasize quite innocently, have been led into habits that are gaining a stranglehold on some of the very elite in the army of the Lord. I fear that there are some here this morning who are far less effective and far less satisfied with themselves than they could be or would be if they weren't so afflicted. Many of you may be victims and may not realize it. I'd like to use an analogy that I used a few years ago because I think it makes the point that is the prime point I want to make this morning. In east central Arizona, there are some high and often snow packed mountains. We refer to them as the White Mountains. From this fountainhead stem most of the major water producing streams that fill the agricultural valleys and uh, the agricultural needs and the domestic needs of central Arizona. From these mountains comes the water supply for the homes in the city of Phoenix. In the wintertime, the mountains are covered with snow, oftentimes many feet in depth. The streams, as they begin here, run cool and clear, filled with delicious, life-giving water. The streams run many miles in this unpolluted condition as they move down the mountains, through the valleys, eventually to empty into great reservoirs built to store the liquid during periods of drought. There are also in eastern Arizona many high-grade ore deposits which are are and have been mined for many years, copper being one of the principal metals. Some of the streams that originate in the White Mountains run through the mining towns, and their water is used by the smelters in the processing of ore. The waste from this process in some cases finds its way back into the streams, causing discoloration and the addition of harmful elements that make the water unfit for human consumption, these streams also empty into the great reservoirs. There are seasons of the year when there are cloudbursts in the mountains upstream from the dam. The heavens literally open up and discharge their contents. As it does, on these occasions, large amounts of soil are eroded, brush, and sometimes trees and also are also washed down the rivers into the reservoirs. These reservoirs have the unusual capacity of holding all that is put in them, the cool and clean, clear and delicious water coming from the glistening snowpack, as well as the polluted water from the industries and the brown, silt-filled waters resulting from the summer thunderstorms. All of it accumulates behind the huge rock and concrete dams 
As we said, part of the water that is held behind these dams is used as the domestic water supply for over a million people. In this condition, the water, of course, is now undrinkable because of the impurities that have been dumped into it, and so there must be a filtering system that prepares it for human consumption. First, there are large grates and nets and coarse screens that filter out leaves and branches and dead animal life. The filtering system gets finer and finer as it removes other harmful impurities. Finally, after much careful attention, it is released into the pipelines of the cities in a now purified condition ready to be used by the people of the valley. When we were born on the earth, our minds and thoughts were clean and sweet and pure, unpolluted by the harmful impurities that come to us as a part of the experiences of this life. In our infancy, our minds are free from unrighteous and unwholesome thoughts. We are innocent and untouched by the harmful effects and influences of Satan. Our mind, which is like a tremendous reservoir itself, is capable of taking in whatever it may be fed, good and bad, trash and garbage, as well as righteous thoughts and experiences. As we go through life, we may be exposed to stories, pictures, books, jokes, language, and language that are filthy and vulgar, or to television shows, videos, or movies that are not right for us to see or hear. Our mind will take it all in. It has the capacity to store whatever we will give it. Unfortunately, what our mind takes in, it keeps sometimes forever. It's a long, long process to cleanse a mind that has been polluted by unclean thoughts. Sometimes our minds may be so cluttered with filth and pollution <clears throat> that they are unable to be a spiritual strength to us and our families, let alone mankind in general. When in this condition we find our thinking processes are not clear or correct. Schoolwork may be overwhelming. Everyday problems are more difficult to solve. Decisions, decisions are often made on shaky ground. We say and do things we would otherwise never be a part of. We are not at our best. There are two things we must do. First, we must stop the flow into our minds of these unhealthy and unwholesome streams of experiences and thoughts. Evil acts are preceded by unrighteous thoughts, and unrighteous thoughts are born of vulgar stories and jokes and pictures and, pictures and conversations and a myriad of other satanic products. Now, vulgarity appears in many ways. We live in a society where profanity and vulgarity are accepted means of conduct and expression, even a way of life for some. Elder Packer has said, The reality of profanity does not argue for the toleration of it. We are the victims of a vile habit. There are those here this morning who are victims who are misled into thinking this is acceptable conduct for a saint, who think the influence is not that serious. I would suggest that some are misled who think vulgarity occurs only now and then when a person utters obviously crude or offensive words. Vulgarity is not so rare as it should be. It is sustained by constant exposure to, steady to a steady diet of vulgar and filthy experiences. We might consider vulgarity in a couple of ways. First, <clears throat> as an expression of a personal weakness, and second, as a contribution to a personal weakness. Some demonstrate or express a personal weakness when they tell jokes or stories about the body and its functions, when they joke about or make suggestive comments concerning women or girls, when they are casual about sacred things. There is vulgarity when some speak crudely of body parts or sexual matters, too often common slang, even gutter terms, are used by brethren of the priesthood as well as by too many of the sisters. 
and oft-times anger is used as an excuse for such an utterance. Now this is wrong. It comes of Satan. He is the author. No one needs swear or be vulgar at any time. Some contribute to this personal weakness. When they read or experience filthy magazines, filthy movies or television shows or video, or remain in a group where unclean, unclean discussions occur. Some married couples will even joke about sexual matters. Each of these kinds of experiences will weaken any spirit and will make it less able to withstand the fiery darts of the adversary. Now, my brothers and sisters, beware of loose thinkers, be they peers or teachers. The subtlety of their influence can be disarming and destructive. Regardless of what others may do, there should not be any X or R-rated movies that we participate in viewing or talking about. Shun them as you would the plague. A good movie with only a little pornography or vulgarity is not a good movie. It is satanic. There must be no pornographic magazines or pictures or music, and I plead with you, be careful of the music. Or stories, no retelling of filthy jokes or crude experiences. You know, once in a while, we should stop and ask ourselves, in whose army are we fighting? Whose battle lines are we defending? Satan's or the Savior's? We're in one or the other. And like it or not, our actions signal our true allegiance. Do you have the courage to walk out of an off-color PG-rated movie or video? Or do you watch and listen and absorb and suggest to yourself, this soon will pass or everyone is doing it. It must be acceptable entertainment. Have you the courage to keep out of your home some television shows? and videotapes that are filled with suggestive sexual conversation and even visual experiences. I think one of the subtle dangers that we have uh, are the so-called soaps. They uh, tell, teach, display uh, the deteriorating breakdown, uh, breakdown in morals and in marriage. Have you thought lately how effective these shows are in piercing even the strongest spirits we must not feed ourselves a diet of trash. We become what we think. We think about things we hear and read and see. This morning, run through an exercise with me for just a moment. Put yourself on whatever level you are as we talked about that ladder, the ladder of faith and testimony. Whether you're here or here, as I said, doesn't really matter. But now assume that tonight, or this evening you watch a movie or a show of whatever kind where there is obvious sexual conversation and, and uh, implications of breakdown in morals and so on. If you watch that show, whatever level you're on, in my opinion, your spirit will step down just a bit after having had the experience. Just a bit, not much, but a bit. Or assume that this afternoon you're involved in retelling an off-colored story, your spirit will step down again. Now, every time we go through one of these experiences, it's been my observation that the spirit steps down little by little and little by little. And as I review church court cases, I have reviewed them over the years, I find that the tragedies that occur in the lives of men and women do not occur overnight in a hurry. They are a step-by-step -step process. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you go to one of these, you're going to be involved in immorality. Some will in the process. But I do know this. There will be a dilution of your strength, the spiritual strength within you, that will have its effect long term, even though you never get involved in an immoral setting. There will be a dilution of your righteousness and your power to do good, to think clearly, to make decisions that are proper every time you 
put some of this material into your mind. Now, assuming that we have cut off the flow of trash, and I'm not saying cut it down, I'm saying cut it off. The second thing we must do is to develop a filtering system which will cleanse the great reservoir of our mind so that the thoughts coming from it may again be pure and fit for our use and for the blessing of others. The effectiveness of our filtration system depends upon the pattern of our lives. We will be no more successful in helping ourselves and others than we are pure in our minds. True, we may systematically perform many of the tasks that are assigned us in the Church. Teach a Sunday school class, Relief Society, or a priesthood lesson, prepare reports, conduct meetings, and so on. But unless our spirit is in tune and we speak, teach, and act under the direction of the Holy Spirit, we accomplish little of an eternal value. The secret of cleansing our spirit of whatever the impurity is not very complicated. It begins with prayer every morning and ends with prayer every night. This is the most important process I know, and more, most important step I know in the process. It may simply be a prayer for strength to turn from bad habits, or a prayer that sin will be distasteful to you, remembering that all prayers are not answered the next day. Sometimes it takes a long time. But with this step in place, I have seen hundreds of miracles take place without it. There is continued frustration, unhappiness, ineffectiveness, and despair. And if you have tried and have given up, I plead with you to try again and again and again. He will not forsake your efforts if you persist. Secondly, an added refinement will come in your filtering process. An added measure of spiritual maturity, if you please, can be found in a daily study of the scriptures. Not long, perhaps, but every day. If I were one of you, I would read the scriptures tonight and never let a day pass without reading some in them, even if only a few minutes. There is an added measure of inspiration promised to those who read the scriptures regularly that others do not receive. Surely at this time in your life this would be a welcome assist. Thirdly, continue the cleansing of your spirit by doing something good for another that he or she doesn't expect. Keep it simple, but do it daily. It may only be a cheery hello, a short daily phone call to a homebound friend, a wheelchair ride for an elderly patient, a thoughtful note to someone who's sick or lost a friend. It may even be picking up your dirty clothes will thrill an unsuspecting roommate. According to the scripture, a disciple of the Savior is first a servant of others. Fourth, when necessary, receive the blessing that comes through the confession process. Too many are harboring the inner feeling of guilt resulting from unrepented mistakes. Part of the repented process is confession. If you happen to be one of those who has this need, I plead with you to go see your bishop before the sun sets today. And finally, pick a commandment you're still struggling with and obey, and give it an honest chance to bless your life. Now remember, first stop the flow of pollution, of polluted thoughts. Be far more selective of the experiences we feed the great reservoir of our mind. Second, develop an effective filtering system that will remove the impurities and cleanse the spirit. Let your spirit become a powerful influence for good. Spirituality is a product of righteousness. It is not an unearned gift. Again, remember that when we are in tune spiritually, we can handle any problem, and you can be sanctified. I testify this morning that the Savior is at the head of this work for which you and I are responsible. I also add my prayer that we will each be found faithful in the things with which we have been entrusted. For the Lord said, 
O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. This, then, purity of thought, is one of the secrets to a happy and productive life and to the eternal rewards of a loving Father in heaven. Of this I testify in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.